I'd like to convene uh, the Best Practices and Innovations OEIB subcommittee. Do we need to take a roll on this one? No? Okay. And do we have anybody on the phone joining us? Okay, sounds great. All right, we're going to start with opening discussion. I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Kerr for opening comments. Um, as you know, we've had an opportunity to um, go throughout the state, uh, most recently in John Day, uh, to turn uh, our, uh, both our ears and our minds over uh, to listening to the communities um, in many, many communities throughout Oregon. And uh, as you might guess, uh, we are hearing um, lots and lots of really good and powerful information as to not only how people feel, but what they would ultimately like to see uh, in terms of uh, uh, compacts and a whole host of other uh, topics that come up rather serendipitously in the course of the conversation. And um, I thought what I would do is just for the sake of the committee, to just, you know, sort of, this is my own checklist, but it's a way of being able to sort of just thread the, thread the needle of this, of today's conversation, um, and um, talk a little bit about uh, what we're hearing so far, um, uh, and, and at least punctuate some of the work that we're doing in the subcommittee. Um, what, I, what I've heard is essentially, and I'll do these in relatively quick order, one, is that most communities, if not all, have indicated an interest in wanting to return lost dollars from the base uh, funding uh, and then restore things such as full school days, class size, uh, class sizes uh, uh, to something more appropriate, um, restore counselors um, and uh, critically librarians. Um, there was a particular uh, focus on uh, from some of the communities on really supporting uh, families uh, whose first language particularly uh, is not English and ways by which to make sure that those communities are integrated uh, and involved in all levels of transformation of the state's P20 system. A second thing that we're hearing is that there is a need to include a focus on and funding for services uh, to support par <coughs> excuse me, parents and this is particularly true of parents um, and students who are trying to either go through uh, uh, the P20 system, but also, more importantly, go through the post-secondary institutions, community colleges and higher ed specifically. Um, we heard from some uh, uh, additional parents uh, whose first language is not English. They came, they gave very, very poignant testimony as to the needs for supporting uh, their students through the use of uh, existing federal dollars for Title I and others um, that uh, um, that they want to be sure that the money went exactly where their kids' greatest need was. Third thing we heard was uh, on the compacts and the need to change the compacts to reflect a culture of mutuality and collaboration and innovation um, that would allow us to spur uh, more and more uh, kind of cross-institutional uh, practice and enable that practice to become the norm. Um, uh, a fourth thing that we heard was uh, to focus on investments in reducing costs of going to college and maximize the access for college through the Oregon Opportunity Grant. Uh, and a fifth thing uh, overall was to maintain the EST structure and services to small districts. Um, these are sort of broad brush uh, issues that um, I bring to you, not only because they represent sort of much of the, the, the sort of conversation that we've had pretty much throughout, but it's also one point that is uh, very intriguing and useful for us to delve into at the appropriate time, which is the issue of the compacts and the ways by which um, we might want to reframe that discussion and reframe that work. Um, such that it, it takes advantage of some of the synergies <coughs> and the best practice that we're seeing already in the system um, and allows for people uh, to have the sense of mutuality that, that they're so um, deeply committed to wanting to see. 
Um, so uh, I will have a, a deeper presentation on, on that issue at the appropriate time. I'm not prepared to make a particular recommendation to the committee today, but I do want you to be aware that I have been at least thinking about this and talking it through, um, uh, but I am not, uh, I'm not ready to make a full, a full presentation. Thank you. We'll check in with you and okay. see when you're ready to do that. Okay. The next thing on our ag agenda today is invited testimony from OSBA, COSA, and OEA. Uh, they have a, they formed a coalition to discuss and make recommendations to the K-12 Achievement Compact. And I believe we have members from all three organizations coming together to make a presentation. Looks like Morgan and... Well, good morning, Chair Curtis, Dr. Curtis, and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Morgan Allen. I'm here on behalf of the Oregon School Boards Association. And I know Craig Hopkins made some comments last time, so I'll try to keep those brief and talk a little bit about our joint work on achieving compacts. Uh, a couple additional uh, thoughts from the, the OSBA perspective on compacts, and we have to answer any questions. So as you know, our three organizations began meeting in February, very high levels of our executive uh, directors, our elected officers from our memberships have been meeting, and before you have a document that includes joint recommendations that has a model of collaboration and several other recommendations to the committee, and I know Craig talked about those last time, so I just want to reiterate uh, a couple of them. The first is specifically about moving the Achievement Compact submission deadline back to the fall from the current date, date of June 30th. We've heard this consistently from board members, superintendents, and other educators. Generally, the concern is around when data is released, uh, you know, dealing with the U.S. Department of Ed, the State Department of Ed, when the final data is available to make those decisions. So that's, I think, probably the number one priority that we have put forward. So the second one I just want to reiterate very briefly is, um, as the compacts mature, we hope that there is strong consideration given at the ODE level and the OAIB level, providing adequate staffing support. Because I know that uh, Ms. Lau gets a lot of questions uh, from districts, and as this process continues to mature and, and uh, people get deeper into the work, and now with Achievement Compact Advisory Committees and sort of the first full run in doing this, there's going to be more required uh, districts and folks in the field are going to ask for more assistance and gonna, they're going to want to require more assistance. So anything that you can do to help provide resources at the state level, um, FAQs, technical manuals, other things like that would be greatly appreciated. The third thing our organization suggested, and this is something that may uh, be a conversation, a longer conversation later on, is the idea of putting together voluntary teams that would include representatives of our three organizations, the Department of Ed, OEIB, to go out to districts where there may be issues uh, on coming to agreement on achievement compact, sort of an intervention team that could go out and voluntarily assist boards, superintendents, and educators in sort of working through any contentious issues they might have with their compacts. That's something we'd like you to consider, and, and our organizations would be willing to put people forward in, in that effort. Um, the fourth thing that we've heard a lot, particularly from board members and superintendents, is just clarity around achievement compacts versus report cards. We know there's a re comprehensive review of the report card going on right now, and recommendations are going to be coming out in March. And uh, one of the concerns that we have is that a lot of folks, because the achievement compact is the thing that's out there right now, it's becoming sort of the primary uh, student achievement accountability tool. We know that's not really how it was designed for that. It's sort of in combination with report cards. So continuing to sort of bring clarification would be appreciated. And one of the things that you'll hear our three organizations talk about ad nauseum, and one of the things we did appreciate about the, the creation of the compacts was mandate relief and paperwork reduction. And we we're really trying to focus what we are require our districts to report on at the state level. We know that Dr. Saxton has made a primary focus of his efforts at the Department of Education on moving back to a more service-oriented Department of Education, sort of more from the regulatory role that was forced upon the department by No Child Left Behind. So that's greatly appreciated as well. A couple other things, just specifically from the OSBA perspective, we know that COSA has put forward some additional recommendations from their superintendents. We're generally in agreement with those recommendations as an organization. A couple things 
Uh, specifically, there's been a lot of talk about the makeup of the Achievement Compact Advisory Committees and who could be on them, who are voting members. From the school board perspective, we're fine with adding parents back. As a matter of fact, we would go further and say, whoever a school board would like to put on those Achievement Compact Advisory Committees, whether it's a, a philanthropist in the community, a business person, a, a community member, parents, we, we would be fine with the addition of any folks for those. Uh, as well, or a school board member, for example. School board, you know, it would be maybe nice if one of the school board members could serve on that as well to sort of keep the board perspective going on as well. One of the other things that we've heard from small districts uh, around using only percentages is that when you use only percentages for target setting on the compacts, that you can have significant deviations year over year when you have very small cohorts. Uh, and so, uh, you know, there's no really, we don't really have a solution. We've been sort of racking our brains about what to do with that, but possibly uh, for very small districts, you might want to keep both percentage and numeric targets on the compacts. Uh, because as you know, like if you have a, a cohort of only 12 or 14 students, and you know, over a 10 year period, your district graduates 80 or 90% of your kids, you might have one year where instead of having 10 or 11 graduates out of that cohort of 12, if you have eight, you have 65% you know, graduates. And so it can, it, it can produce wild swings in districts. So, um, that's something that you may want to think about, perhaps some narrative or perhaps keeping some of those. I know that um, that's been an issue of concern on those very small cohorts. And just a couple of closing thoughts on achievement compacts. We would continue uh, support of allowing the school boards to have final say over the compacts. We know the advisory committee process advises that, um, but we believe it's appropriate that since the school boards are the ones that are going to be held to account by the OEIB and the legislature, and more importantly, their voting constituents, that they have the ability to put forward the final version of the compact. And we know that having observed the first achievement compact process, there was a very intensive lobbying about uh, adding metrics to the compacts. We would strongly encourage you to keep the metrics as limited as possible. That idea of keeping it to one page you know, six or eight or ten really high-level metrics. And a lot of those other things that people are bringing forward are very appropriate things to measure for accountability purposes in K-12. We would just argue that those are probably more appropriate for the revised report card. And we would, uh, for example, things like health metrics or poverty metrics, those things are, in our opinion, more appropriate for a report card to give a greater picture of the district. So uh, thank you for the opportunity to come testify today, and we can have to answer any questions about the joint recommendation. Can I ask one question about number three on the creating on-site teams? Um, I know um, part of what we've talked about, that all of these groups are K-12 groups. So as we move down the road and think about other ways that we might look at the compacts, would you be willing to add early childhood and OUS members to those teams as we try to address those transition times? Yeah, I think we would be willing to have a consideration of adding those people. Again, the idea is um, what we've done is we've had a couple joint webinars where we've had representatives from our various memberships actually communicate with uh, folks on webinars. We've put together joint guidance documents, and the idea is that if we could have a representative of the board, management, and labor together trying to help districts work through things on a voluntary basis with the state there to support and provide information and assistance that we could probably work through the few instances that we know are eventually going to pop up in districts where there's going to be strong disagreement at the local level about what goes on the compact. And we think getting people together and having a conversation about that. And I think we've been very encouraged from the school board perspective, we've been very encouraged with our partnerships with OEA and COSTA. Uh, you know, it's, it's been really productive for our memberships. We've gotten really positive feedback from our memberships and people like the idea of working together. So that's something that we thought would be a way to sort of extend that out into the field directly, rather than just sort of having webinars and throwing out documents, actually getting out in the field, getting our hands dirty, uh, and helping on the ground directly. That's a great idea, and I heard you say that all those organizations are ready to um, appoint people to help on those teams. I think that's very fair to say. Uh, a couple questions. Yes. First of all, I'm uh, impressed that it says five-year cohort versus a four-year. You actually, we actually had someone one fifty-fifty on that one. Um, a couple questions, uh, you know, Morgan, one of the real great benefits of uh, OSBA is are your research tours. And, and I'm just thinking a little bit about, you know, as Rudy mentioned, OEIB has been going around the state and providing some of the feedback that we've heard. OSBA also has done 
uh, quite, a, quite an effort to get out and listen to school boards and administrators and teachers throughout the area or throughout the state. So you may not be able to answer this, and these questions may be something that you could further help us with in research, but I'm, they're dealing with specifics. Okay? So we have heard loud and clear, and I think you know, for us to through this process for quite a while, there aren't any surprises about what I'm going to say. But the paperwork reduction and the impact that's having on schools, we, we, we uh, try to address it through the Division 22 stamp assurances. We've got some other types of things. But are there some specifics we can land on more so than reduced paperwork? Because we hear that term, but what around the state are some, some wins we could get to reduce that paperwork and some specifics for it? Well, that's an excellent question. We have a list. Let me give you a couple examples for the short term and a couple Great. examples that the OEIB and the legislature and the governor are going to have to think about uh, much quicker than they probably want to. In the short term, you know, a prime example of a mandate that we talked about being read up in the 2012 session is school districts are required right now to report on the number of minutes that students take physical education a week. They're also required to report on basically the square footage of physical education, uh, in classrooms, gyms, play sheds, etc. And they have to do that every year. And we know because of funding and other issues that we're going in the wrong direction on that. And we know that there's not a uh, PE gym building street. So that's one example short term, I think we'll certainly get back to you with some others. In the longer term, the, the, there's a couple that really are great concern, certainly to school board members, and I would assume to our, our partners at, at OEA and COSA. The first is in 2015, we have a kindergarten semi-mandate coming on board, where if districts choose to offer full-day kindergarten, they can get a full weight from the state school fund. Yet, we know that there's, been, there's no, part, as part of that legislation, there's no corresponding investment in the state school fund. Cover that. So essentially what you're doing is you're taking a little piece from grades 1 through 12 to pay for that extra weight for kindergarten unless you add more money to the pot. A second example is in the 2017-18 school year, school districts are going to be held to providing a certain number of physical education minutes to their students. And we're fine to do that, but we're going to have to talk about an investment to do that. And those are just a couple ideas in the short term, a couple ideas that you'll be grappling with long term, but I think it's an important conversation, and please do not underestimate the power of those bills that we have been able to pass in conjunction working together as a coalition in the last couple of sessions. It makes a big difference out in the field. It may not you know, save millions and millions of dollars and tens of thousands of hours, but it certainly saves some amount of dollars, and it certainly saves some amount of hours, and more importantly, it gives people hope that when they complain about reports, that someone in Salem is actually listening, and it's made a big difference. Okay. Uh, Two other quick questions. Small school cutoff. It seems to me heard a lot that the larger districts want percentages. Then you hear the specific examples that you already used of small school and the inconsistency of numbers on all of this data. Has there been any kind of talk on what that cutoff is? No, frankly. We, we've had a couple discussions internally about what the solution to that could possibly be. Is it some sort of narrative, for example? Um, if you have an, if you're a, a district that say over a 10 or 15 year period you're graduating 80 to 90 percent of your students in, in one time and now you have 65 or 60, you know, is there an opportunity to add a narrative to the compact is one idea, but I think that gets complicated and there's always going to be concerns about, you know, who writes that and what does it say and, and, and things like that. Um, as far as size goes, I believe the, and Margie can correct me wrong, but the, the stars go on the compacts at eight or six? Six. Six. Or six okay. or less. So, I mean, it's a pretty, so you, I mean, we're talking about seven, eight, nine, ten, I mean, very small, core, reportable cohorts where you can see significant percentage difference where in the public time they can look at it one year and it's 95%. That's an A, and the next year it's 60, that's an E or an F. Um, and it could really only be one or two students um, making that difference. And, and uh, that's not to say that, that it's not appropriate that we track that, but there has to be some sort of account for those very small districts and those very small cohorts where just one student can swing it from kind of looking like it's a pass. So, yeah. Okay. All right, final, final question there. You know, I think we all are in agreement we want to simplify the compacts and the sheer volume of cells is an issue for district, districts as well as whether you have students in that disadvantaged cell numbers that are adequate statistically. Been any discussion on that, on the volume of cells, on prioritizing 
not really from the school board perspective. I think it, the key message to deliver on the compacts from the school board perspective is keep it simple, keep it one page, keep it high level metrics, and give us the sort of FAQs, the technical manuals that the state supports so that if we have questions or we run into problems, we know there's someone we can go to. Just two quick questions and then one more. Um, to follow up with Mark said, I, with the small school districts, I don't have the report here, but I remember we had a, a listing of all 197 school districts and there were a group at the end that were too small to report. I don't remember the official language. So what are you saying that would be different than that or is that not? Well, going forward, uh, my understanding was that was sort of, because it was the first time, and, and I don't know the backstory of how that was discussed, but I know that some many of the very tiniest districts got letters basically saying, we understand you're in compliance, thank you for submitting, we know you have these really tiny cohorts. But going forward, that's going to be a question, because we want to measure those districts and make sure they're held to account, but the question is, um, where, you have, where you can have those wild swings on percentages. How do we how do we sort of address that so that the public gets a better understanding of uh, what's really going on in the district when those numbers can change wildly from year to year in those subcategories or even the larger categories like graduation if you have a very small senior class or okay good uh, another one was and, and I agree that I think uh, the accountability part in, in, especially in its extreme is just too much on these compacts kind of lost track of them being a roadmap to 40, 40, 20. Uh, you talked about a revised report card could incorporate some of those. Do, do you know what the process is to who would be in charge of that? Would that be the legislature? My understanding um, is that Ben Cannon is working, is sort of heading up the process for the report card committee that's, and they actually have met several times. We have a school board member on there, there's a 15 or 17 member person in that work, then that initial work is going on to bring recommendations back to you folks, I think in March, or, or earlier than that, so a legislative proposal. We may proposal. ask for a report early on, but yeah, sometime in the spring is when they need to have okay. that. And then one, one more uh, item, and it's based on, you, you were talking about additional staff resources from the Department of Education, OEIB, to help assist districts, on-site teams, for assistance and training, and um, we've also been discussing two kind of a best practices manual or something. I know there's best practices in the quality education model too, and there's, there's other existing best practices out there. But kind of putting them together in light of 40, 40, 20, and uh, completion goals. Um, if you're your members, have the board members talked at all about that, some kind of thing, or is that what you're seeing in some of these teams, some of the staff assistants? Yeah, I think what we envision, and in, in, the, in the larger document, we put together a first guidance document that was really based on the, the Springfield model that Nancy Gold and, and the educators and folks down in Springfield is. Something our three organizations thought could be held up as a, a model for how to put together the compact advisory team and some concrete steps you can take at the district level to do that. I think you know part of the challenge is there's there's there seems to be one dedicated staffer that gets a lot of calls and a lot of questions, and I don't think we can anticipate all the questions and things that are going to come up in the field. So I think really that recommendation is really kind of like we all need to be ready to deal with the unexpected around achievement contacts because we had a very compressed time period. It was the first time everyone done, did it, um, and now we have uh, advisory committees, OSBA, and I know. Coast and OE are all certainly encouraging a very public process, you know, talking about it at board meetings and things like that. The advisory committees themselves are public. So, um, you know, anything that the, the Department of Ed and the OEIB could put together, sort of guidance documents, FAQs, the stuff that's come out, we've appreciated. It's been good. But we just anticipate the need for more. And we, we don't know what that is, but it's going to be along the lines of technical help, I, I, I would be sure, especially around data, um, and especially if the metrics change. If the OEIB significantly changes the metrics, uh, people will have to kind of go back to the drawing board and, and Margie and hopefully more people will have to deal with a new round of questions and concerns. Dr. Kirk? Um, so hearing from uh, both the community college level in particular, but, um, but individuals along the way in these forums and so forth, 
made me um, start thinking about um, different kinds of models. And I, I, all I would like would just be your thought, if uh, either of you uh, can comment on it. Just your thought about a different um, uh, structure, right? And so, what if what if the compacts were were regional in, in, in structure, um, and they and they gave essentially this sort of mutuality uh, issue life. But they gave it within the context of universities, community colleges within a given region, districts within a given region, ESDs within a given region, but that they essentially all had a set of metrics, all of which were regional in, 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 uh, in, their, in their origin. Um, and they uh, obviously focused on achievement. They were intended, if you will, to become, uh, as I think David just said, a sort of a, a performance roadmap as opposed to a strict, if you will, accountability tool. The report card, in my mind, would then be the, the actual tool for accountability. But, but that, you know, it, 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 it operates in a way that creates a sort of a synergy among and between the various uh, people within a given region, and again, as you said, you know, you conceivably have business uh, and, and, and other enterprise uh, principles, if you will, um, uh, as a part of it. But the idea here is that the mutuality is spread laterally among and between institutions within a region, and 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 allows for people, if you will, to be held to account within the region. So if, 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 one, if one were thinking about how this would lay out, it could conceivably be that a region might have a specific set of targets that are um, born out of the, the current database of that region. And so uh, it, wouldn't, it, wouldn't be, it wouldn't be specific to the state overall, but it would be specific to where that region is now and where a year or two years or whatever from now you want to see it be. Um, give me your opinion of that. Leave alone the logistics of making any kind of a transition to that now, but just just what's what's your thought about something like that? Well, and I'm, I'm going to go out on a linear because obviously I haven't talked to our Brother, members about this, but <laughs> I'll do it anyway. We, want the we are all out on limbs right now. I, I think my initial We're response to that you, is... I'll weasel a little bit and say I'd like to see it flushed out and sort of how it would work in practice. But I think my initial response would be, I think we, as our board members, like the system as it is right now with the achievement compacts because they are responsible uh, for the things that they have control over directly. Um, and I think there's questions about funding variances between community colleges, universities, and K-12 districts at the local level. Another thing that I think maybe it pose a challenge regionally is what always surprises me when we talk about partnerships. You hear examples like the Eastern Promise, where we know that's a very regional thing. But when we go out and talk to districts, I'm always surprised because of technology that those sort of regional barriers are breaking down, where you'll find districts or community colleges that are not in a reasonable days or afternoons drive, but they actually have partnerships and they're doing it online or they're doing it virtually. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, that may just be something to consider. but. What we like about the current system from a school board's perspective is that uh, our boards are responsible to both the state and their constituents. And um, there's always, I would just worry that there would be finger pointing if you started to make it bigger where everybody's responsible because somebody's always going to be doing a little bit better or think they're carrying a little more of the water than somebody else. And I would be worried a little bit about finger pointing. And that's my honest gut reaction to sort of regionalizing it or taking it bigger or scaling it to larger compacts? Mm -hmm. That's a good question, and certainly we'd be willing to talk about it, give it some more thought, but. You know, more because what Dr. Cruz is going with that is one prevailing theme is one size doesn't fit all. Mm -hmm. And we hear that embedded in so many conversations with different terms. You can say it's local control versus centralization to one size. And what's clear is how diverse more it is. And we look at a lot of the efforts going on, whether it's accountability of, whether it's CCOs, it's that loose tight model. 
where the state you know, determining what's tied is the investments and then the regionally the innovation. So I don't know. I mean, I mean it, it, it's something that I think we need to play with. Um, is trying to find that that happy middle. But I think really a goal of ours, and just what we've all heard over and over, is the innovation is going to happen at a local level. How is it going to happen at a local level? How do you support that? How do you build that capacity across the state? Colleen, did you have a separate set of comments? I do. Okay. Is Good the rest morning. of the committee okay with moving forward? Yes. Okay. And perhaps I can address the question or at least respond somewhat, um, you know, as I talk to you about the work we've been doing. Um, Chair Curtis, Dr. Crew, members of the committee, for the record, I'm Colleen Lamb, and I'm with the Center for Great Public Schools at the Oregon Education Association. And one of the things that's happening in the center is really um, focusing around helping teachers prepare for policy discussions and coming to the tables. And the Achievement Compact is giving us that opportunity. Um, and uh, I, I would like to frame some comments around this whole notion of alignment and partnership. And we have an example that I think is emerging. We're not there yet, but it is that whole notion of aligning and partnering the work. And I want to just uh, set the stage with Senate Bill 290 and the evaluation system. We came together as a coalition around that policy. We're, we're collaborating around identifying some action. And we're partnering around the implementation. And the implementation coming from various partners, whether it be OSBA, COSA, OEA, Chalkboard, uh, the Department of Ed, whatever it might be, is focusing on making sure the message is the same around implementation. And we're, we're leveraging resources and building resources from each other, making sure that message is not confusing for districts. But we're leveraging the resources of our, our associations to get down to the implementation level, which is very critical. So, you know, we've been thinking about that from the standpoint of the achievement compacts. Bringing um, the three organizations together as well as other, other organizations, but thinking about that in relationship to the work on the ground. So what I'd like to, to share with you very briefly today is the work that we've started in the center around these achievement compacts with members. And it really does get at some of the, the recommendations and, and some questions around what might be those next steps. So um, what we've been doing in the, in the month of October is we've been out doing regional workshops with members, with teachers, and helping to prepare them with information around what is this achievement compact and technical information around um, those goals, those measures, and those targets. And thinking about it from a personalized level at a local level. So they're bringing their achievement compacts and we're using it as a, as a teaching tool or uh, at a beginning level of examination, and I really want to emphasize that. It's been very beginning. Um, but it's, it's, it's focusing on that and it's focusing on this notion of collaboration. You know, as a member of an association, how do what what skills do we bring to the table to foster this collaborative process? Not just for the achievement compacts, but for other work. The the uh, educator evaluation work is all about collaboration. There's certainly many more things that are emerging. So we're really trying to focus on those two things right now, and that is a knowledge base about what are these achievement compacts, and really good questions surfacing from these teachers and how might collaboration look within your school district with the achievement contact being the focus. So we've done, um, we've done three regional workshops in the month, month of October. We were in Eastern Oregon at La Grand, and La Grand. We were in Medford and we were in the metro area, um, you know, bringing teachers together. So we've just started, and it's not a huge number of teachers, but the word's getting out there about this preparation to come to the table and have rich discussions around these achievement contacts. So, uh, that's that whole notion of trying to align, partner, collaborate. And um, as you can well imagine, that whole notion of collaboration is really tough in relationship to how do we make that happen when we're from that association and bringing that, uh, our, our lens to the table and our voices to the table. So um, <clears throat> when we think about uh, the achievement compacts and the question that you asked, Dr. Crew, um, 
right now, the notion that we've been, or, or the, the idea that we've been using in terms of the discussion is really around personalizing it for that particular district. And teachers grappling with, uh, what, what knowledge do I need? And what we found is helping them think about questions to bring to the table. As simple as, uh, where did these targets come from? How did we get to the, I mean, it, and building a knowledge base among teachers so they can really be thoughtful about the important next steps uh, of those achievement contacts. And those next steps being the planning, how are you going to get there, strategies to use, and then what resources do we need. And we just, you know, started that conversation and it's been really uh, interesting to, to work with the teachers in, in small groups and helping them get there. This isn't just about this target that we've set. It's what do we do with that target as a practitioner and bringing that practitioner voice and thought to the table about that. So that's, the, you know, that's where we've been in the journey over the last month or so. And again, just beginning that, but we're getting more and more associations asking us for assistance to come and you know, work with them and think about what should they know before coming to the table in their local achievement compact discussions? And then where are we going to take it from there? So um, I'm, going to, I'm going to just end with a couple of things that reinforce some of the recommendations and things that we're hearing from teachers as well. Um, I think there is um, a question about, is this just another state level requirement? In other words, a hoop that we have to jump through, or are we building you know, a foundation of meaning to the work in, in our schools? Um, there's huge concern, and this will not be news to you, over time. How do we, the time that it takes to come to the table and to be very thoughtful in planning out the strategies that we're going to use in terms of uh, this achievement compact notion and the impact it has on student achievement. Um, the resource issue. You know, um, lots of questions about how, um, if we're going to get to this target, where are we going to get the resources to do that? And, you know, helping them think through what are those strategies so you can articulate the resources that you might need to get to those targets. Um, in some cases, there, uh, and this is the whole notion of collaboration, they're um, hearing messages like, oh, you don't need to worry about that, teachers. And so working through a strategy about how, what questions do I ask as a teacher coming to the table about us participating in this, this um, work. Um, and then a lot of specific questions just around the measures themselves and building a knowledge base around um, you know, the cohort, cohort measures and you know, all of those kinds of things. So um, I'm going I'm to pause there. That gives you just a sense of the work that we've been doing on the ground trying to build a, build a knowledge base around the compound. And um, it is a very small beginning, but it really has given us a lens around the members and their role as teacher voice to this work. I have a question. How do they get to the workshops? Is it by way of communication? Do they volunteer? I'd like a little more information about that process. Sure. Um, the, uh, the information has gone out through our network, uh, the Oregon Education Association network, and the regional folks that are, that are uh, working in the field, and they get the information to the members in the, in the field about those workshops. Good. Yeah, I think it's real important what you said about educator participation, because it's what I heard too in post-secondary is uh, people want to be involved, and sometimes they're told that, "Oh, don't worry, we'll 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 tell the state, or we'll we'll work it out," you know. And I don't think that really serves uh, any of us well. Um, how? And, and one of the proposals put forth in the um, recommendations was, you know, uh, uh, opening membership on the achievement compact committees, or also. You know, just working more in those committees to build more engagement, mm -hmm. and I think that means with, with obviously with educators too. Do you have you heard other ideas for building more engagement with educators with this or just our whole roadmap to forty forty twenty as we're going on? I think um, right now, David, we are um, the members in our uh, association are so focused on just 
what is this? Those beginning level questions, we haven't gotten there. I think uh, that will surface, certainly in our, um, the information that we're sharing, we're talking about the makeup that, of that committee and the role of the local board and other members. So, but they're not there yet at, at, from what we've heard. I think there's great possibility though in terms of um, even if we're talking about promising practices, what's a, what does that engagement look like? Are there some uh, tools and information, and we're going to address that, that might be helpful for uh, school districts' communities around that? And I, I, that's actually a very important point, I think, for this committee and the OEIB. If, as we look at changes or improvements or revisions to the compact, that they are actually documents that people aren't caught up in just what's this here and what's this and why, why are we doing this, that it should be much clearer in what, what are the goals there, the aspirations, the visions, and that they're actually uh, motivating people and we're not getting so, I think that is the problem. We are getting very caught up on some of the details and metrics in them and losing sight of what they should be about. So thank you for that. Well, one comment after that, if it's all right, and this Please. partially addresses the question that Dr. Greer posed to us about uh, regional. But one of the things I think all three of our organizations consistently hear from we, we, when we get feedback from them is if they're going to it's sort of like we've just made a significant change to the governance system in K-12 education. We've just made a significant addition with achievement compacts. We've missed, just made a significant uh, omission, I guess, by getting the weight from no child left behind. We need some time to process and work through these things because we haven't done them before. Don't change them too much. Give us time to work through it at the field level and implement it don't keep moving the goalposts or changing what everything looks like. We've, we've, you've just radically altered the system. Give it a chance to sort of take hold at the, at the for lack of a better term, the grassroots level and give us time to work with it. Don't, don't keep poking at it. Okay, okay Morgan, I, 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 I want to follow up on that, though, because that, that's in contrast to we need to simplify these. And we need to land on some common agreed upon, like fight your vote for it. And I understand what you're saying, I mean, I've heard that as well, but, I, but to me, they're kind of pushing against each other, and we're going to move forward. So give me your thoughts on, is this an overall, is this a tweak, is this, can we wait for the, you know, see what the report card lands? And I think my comments are really, when I, when I talk about giving it time to mature, I think uh, not making massive changes to the system. Is, is people need time to process this. They, we haven't even gone through one full achievement contact cycle. And I don't think, you know, taking a, a metric, switching a couple metrics, but what we're talking about is don't turn it into two pages. Don't make it 20 metrics. Don't make it 15. Keep it to that six to eight high-level things, graduation rates, academic measures, funding, things like that. So um, that, that, I think that's what I really mean is don't just keep, give, give people time to work through it once, and then maybe we could have a different conversation Any other members have comments? I'd like to uh, add one, and first of all, just to continue to say I greatly appreciate the collaboration that's going on, and I just recently heard about the um, OEA's leadership in approaching districts to work on some of the places where we have questions around the evaluation mm -hmm. uh, model. Mm -hmm. And I just am so excited and hopeful about that collaboration. I mean, just literally get goosebumps when I hear those, because... Um, it will save us time, and we all know that we have kids we want to save right now. And so I just really appreciate the hopeful intention of people getting together and trying to figure those things out. And wherever practitioners can help lead the way, it makes so much sense. And I know that's hard to do when a lot of times practitioners feel they're sort of left out of, of the information. I think sometimes even those of us at the table feel like it's moving so quickly we don't all have the information. So I appreciate that that's a challenging dilemma, and I also appreciate that we need this sense of urgency in order for us to make significant and important changes. So I just commend the organizations that are trying to sort of hold the container for those conversations and to balance that out and to help educate. I also wanted to ask that as you uh, create uh, maybe helpful documents, so if, if there's ways that you're coming up with that make sense to people 
for example, explaining the targets. Right now we're kind of leaning on Margie for everything uh, in terms of those specific pieces of information. But as you get information in the field that you find is helpful to people, if we could sort of collect that as a body of knowledge, then we don't have to reinvent that. So I love that you're doing that. And as, as each organization provides what their members need, I think we can get clearer about what those uh, documents might uh, be so that we sort of create those tools together. So I really appreciate that. And I wanted to ask, first I want to apologize that I didn't reach out to all of you specifically last time. We really were kind of planning the meeting on the fly. And we're leaning on the fact that your recommendations were a collaborative piece of work. So in um, that spirit, I want to just check in with Craig because uh, there have been some questions that have been asked today. I don't know if you want to respond to any of them from COSA's view, even though I know you're working collaboratively. I don't want to miss a piece this time. <laughs> Thanks, Yvonne. I, mm -hmm. I appreciate that. And, and yeah, I mean, part of the reason that I thought it was important for Morgan and Colleen to come up here so they, did, they didn't get that chance mm -hmm. last time. There are a couple of things that, that you've talked about today that I'd really like to respond to. Maybe the first one is Ruby's question about the regional nature of achievement compacts. One of the ways that I think about that question is sort of in their original incarnation or highest and best form when we first started thinking about achievement compacts. My perception is, is that they were about driving conversation and collaboration that would get us to 4041. And by approaching these in a regional way, but at least beginning to think about them more that I think there's an opportunity here to even further drive that that collaboration and conversation across levels. You know, it's, it's, it's curious to me that we've, you know, we've got a 40-40-20 goal that's going to take all of us working together to, to begin to approach that goal, and yet we have silos when it comes to achievement objectives. And so I, I think there's some value. I, I, I understand Morgan's points. I think they make sense as well, but, but I really think it's worth having that conversation. So I'm, I'm, I look forward to that. Anything we can do to, to break down the silos, work together toward that common goal, I think it's good. Um, I had another one, but honestly, <laughs> you like that idea so much. You just exactly. <laughs> so I, I, I appreciated the question. It was interesting. All right. Before we finish up this invited testimony, any more questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So um, we know that there have been lists in some different formats about the recommendations and that some of them, um, Margie provided a document last time that spoke to which ones require statute changes, which ones are guidance and so on. And so I think she's done some further refinement and description so that this committee can understand really what is our task to do around those specific recommendations. And today is an opportunity for us to hear that and then to ask some questions about that. Before I have you do that, I just wanted to um, talk a little bit real quickly about our process as a committee because uh, we did plan last meeting very quickly, put together the agenda with those we thought we could bring, and we know we missed some steps. Um, but in the interim, I've had conversations with different members as well as listening to Dr. Cruz um, Reflecting on your conversation last time, and I think there, this committee is a great opportunity for us to have more discussion about best practices and in innovations than we really have the time for at OEIB meetings. And I know several members of this committee have expressed to me the desire to have that opportunity for conversation. And so, we're of course, we're always constrained by the time, but on. Um, we, I will continue to work with all the members who plan these meetings to try to make sure that we have the time to have some back and forth. Uh, I know even our, in our own community it's frustrating when people are out there listening and they hear things come to the board and then there's no discussion or there's no feedback and it's kind of the nature of how we run board meetings. But this committee, I think we can have some flexibility around that. Um, having said that, there are some things we feel like there's a tight timeline on if we want to get some of these things done soon. 
Um, and one of the things I would like to work with Dr. Crew and Margie and others of your department on before the next meeting is getting really clear about what is the work of this committee, at least what do most of us think is our responsibility at this point, and a possible timeline for when we think decisions might need to be made. So that those who want to come and speak to us and those of us who feel like we have to come to consensus on a decision, we kind of know how much time do we have to discuss and get testimony and where, where do we have more flexibility. So that's just kind of a general statement about that. I wanted to make one other statement, up, and that's about the decision-making process. And we don't have to make any decisions today so we can think about that. But I have had a conversation with members of this committee about what is the responsibility in terms of decisions. I believe we send recommendations to OEIB, but what do we want our process to be? My, uh, my assumption is that we want to build consensus in every way we can. But there might be some times when we really are down to the wire in terms of timeline. And I think it would be helpful to us and to the public listening to know exactly how we're going to make those decisions. So that when we have decisions to make, what I'd like to do is identify at that point before we go into the discussion and decision making how that decision is going to be made on that particular item. Because I think just by the term of the, the name of this committee, best practices and innovations, whenever you're looking at innovations, you can't anticipate what will come or how we will have to make those decisions all the time. But I think we can discuss that with each item. And perhaps you can provide us some guidance in terms of uh, what is this committee's responsibility in relationship to the entire board. So I just throw that out there because I think there were a lot of questions around these recommendations and what exactly this board is supposed to do. So Margie, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, thank you. Uh, from, uh, I, I prepared a document that starts with a heading, but it, it segues into other topics later on, uh, beginning with the COSA recommended changes. And it, it was really COSA plus uh, coalition uh, recommendations that, that we had in hand as uh, the last meeting concluded. Based on those uh, particular items, I've had a series of meetings with staff at the Department of Education and other individuals around uh, each one of those recommendations and uh, any further discussion or follow along conversation that needs to occur at the subcommittee or at the board so that we know specifically how do we want to measure that, uh, how should it be reported, uh, because, you know, the devil's in the details. And when you get into metrics, there are a lot of details. Uh, and that's certainly one of the things I heard as I worked with uh, education entities all across the state in, it, in the first round. On some of these, there was longstanding practice that folks could rely on, and in others, we were on totally new ground. And folks uh, were really struggling to say, you know, how am I supposed to approach this? So the better this group decides and discusses, the better the guidance can be to the folks in the field. So on the first one, uh, there was a recommendation that the submission date be moved from June 30th to the fall, and the specific document said from October through November. Because that particular parameter is in statute, uh, we will need to, uh, if that's a consensus of the board, ask for there to be an amendment to the existing law. And legislative council doesn't deal in ranges. They need a specific date. So I, I noticed from the OSBA document that they spoke of October. I wasn't sure of what the subtleties were around the pros and cons of October versus November. And are we talking the end of those months or where that might be? I think the question in my recollection is just that somewhere in there is when we get data back, and that's kind of where that question is, is when we get things back from ODE. So I'm thinking what we were thinking was that this body would work with ODE around when do we get all that data and what data makes sense. The current year. I mean, it just was completed. Okay. Our, yeah, the, the current year. The current year data. Okay, so, uh, and I don't know if the subcommittee wants to approach these item by item uh, to say that, okay we we concur with that particular recommendation that's come from the coalition 
and this is our instruction, and then I can move forward on each one of those in terms of drafting to bring back to our next meeting. So I'd like to propose we kind of do a thumbs up or thumbs down, and where we think there is not agreement, then we can set those aside and have more conversations, so at least Margie knows what to move forward on. David, you had your hand. Yeah, have we received any input from the post-secondary organizations about this? Is this just a move for the K-12 through to the fall? and keep the calendar the same for the post-secondary organizations to get their compacts in? Uh, there was not a recommendation related to the timing for submission of compacts from the post-secondary sectors. Uh, we do have representatives in the room from at least one of those sectors. I don't know if Cam or Elizabeth would like to react to that, but we've not had a specific recommendation from them. Uh, I I'm, I'm, I don't, I don't know if it's thumbs up or thumbs down right now. So let me, let me just try to work my way through this. So, uh, first of all, I don't, I don't completely understand the notion of from June to October, other than it's a data reference, it's a data point delivery. It's when you have data on, on the on, target. Yeah, but it's data from, from the prior year, or is it the data from the, the new year? And it would be data from the prior year's uh, Oak scores, which is the information that they receive in the fall. And right, graduation. Well, actually, the graduation data does not arrive until January. So that would be a piece that would, would still be from a prior year, if we go with that fall but time is, frame. But, but, but is it the intent to... To have that data, let's, let me just talk PK-12 for a second. I'm going to separate out a for a second there. Is it the intent to then have that, those data then drive both decision-making and instruction? To make decision-making and budget yeah, I mean, information for budget decisions. Yeah, but your staffing is done, your organization your school is done, there's, you know, your budget for the most part is done. So I just don't know what the data does to shift any of the, the variables that you would want to shift such that children get something that they weren't getting a year ago. And why wouldn't you have, and even if, and even if it were, you would you essentially have almost mid-quarter of the first years when you'd first be able to even tee it up. So you're going to have nine weeks of school that these data supposedly are going to drive new information on but it's nine weeks that are gone. So it's like the first quarter of the business cycle, you said, listen, well, we can't do much with that. So we'll start second, second quarter, right? We'll start from November or after Thanksgiving on. There's just something about that that makes me just a little, a little I mean, it just makes me want to ask questions. I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not thumbs up or thumbs down. I just, I, I'm not quite sure I understand it. I like the June date. And if it's a function of us not being able to drive the data to completion by that time, i.e. you can't get back to people, then that's a different problem. But if this is about, well, you can get the data, but, you know, I mean, you can't get the data until October, then I'd rather work on getting the data earlier. I think that, that is the crux of the issue, is the currency of the data. And when you're setting targets in June, basically two years ago, then how do you get real targets with these kids? That's what that's what the issue is created. And that's what the, the fall was, was more, let's get through folks, let's get all the results. But you know, Marty, your comment that you just said about January, that's making me rethink it. And that's a critical, critical metric is the graduation rates. And if they're not coming until January, so, I, I mean, it's an interesting thing, Curry, and, and your comment about you setting your budget, setting your staffing levels, your, your strategic planning. And, and a lot of us do that in the springtime, and so I think that was the other part, it was not just the data part, but so, for example, in my district, if we're having conversations right now around the targets, the next step is to talk about, so what strategies do we need to do to get to the targets? And then we're moving into budget session by winter. We're starting to plan for that. So now I know what I need to fund. And then we go into the budget cycle. 
and then our staffing and all of that is done around between March and May. By the time we get to June, then I'd have everything lined up. I'd know my targets, I'd have my strategies, I'd have my budget, I'd be planning the summer for how I'd move my organization forward and ready to start in the fall. It felt a little sort of mid-process for most of the superintendents. So part of it was data. I'm wondering if one of the things we ought to do is find out, maybe a missing piece for this group is, when when does all that data come to the districts? I'm sure we could just get those dates from us. What are we going to measure? Right. I mean, that's, we, if we're trying to simplify the document, which I think we all hope we can do, what are we going to measure? When is that data available? I mean, to me, for K-12, the most critical one is that graduation rate. And then we look at our investment on third grade literacy. When well, is that data available? And, the most current. And as I talked with districts uh, around the third grade benchmarks, uh, a lot of them were wanting to operate off of the prior year's numbers about what they had achieved. And I'm like, but, but you know, you're really talking about last year's second graders, not last year's third graders. I mean, to me, that Oaks data was really about what had happened, not what's going to happen. And that formative data would probably be more informative around third grade metrics. That's not data that's reported to the state at all. That's it's data that's that some districts don't even have. They don't have third grade. They don't have before third grade. And some people have them, and some people still don't even have those formative measures no, district wide. Yvonne, yes. what would be real helpful for me is that this is some information that I think should have a staff recommendation rather than us having this kind of a conversation. Mm -hmm. Because I don't think I have enough information to say thumbs up, thumbs down, or leave it neutral. And I would really appreciate staff making that recommendation and giving us some sense of why the recommendation is being uh, put forward. And now, I know there's a timeline issue for legislative concepts, so I don't know how much time we have to do that. But I feel like I'm sort of in the dark here in terms mm -hmm. of what's the best direction to move in. And this part of the conversation is a great conversation because I think what we're going to try to invent here is what is our process for making decisions exactly. that's efficient but also effective for everybody. Uh, to that point, I, I rather like uh, Member Tran's notion of let me just bring a set of recommendations. You vote them up, you vote them down. I mean, yeah. at least you have a, a straw man to, to start from, and you're not sort of grappling with the, 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 the issues, frankly, that staff should be grappling with. I can give you a thumbs up on that one. I think that's a great idea. So I, I'm assuming that that recommendation is on all the recommendations, yeah. not just number one. Right, so, look at the example. I mean, we don't have the hot days questions exactly, right? We can't right. comments. Well, we don't even know where higher ed is on that. Do you agree? That's a, that's a K-12 at this point feedback process. And to me, it's maybe also an issue of data delivery and data collection rather than just changing the date to match what, when we're getting the existing data. So is that what we're going to move toward with all of these today? Is I think that makes sense to have staff come together with a set of recommendations because as I glance down, all, there's questions around all of them that we won't be able to answer here. I know one of them I'm looking at is number four where we talked about what's in the waiver. And I know we talked about getting some information about that and maybe you have that, but maybe that's too much in the weeds for this board committee, otherwise we won't have the fruitful conversations we want. One other comment too. Okay. One, one thing that was very frustrating for all of us last year was we kind of used the metaphor that I felt like I had my hand tied behind my back with the report card. The report card and the achievement compact changes have to be hand in hand. So us, you know, you were going to come in spring effort. Uh, if there's any way we can push together that these are on parallel tracks but intersecting along the way, because that's what I felt like having the achievement contact is we didn't have the report card tight enough. We just kept putting things in it, in it, in it, and in my opinion, got away from us. So if we could maybe have the recommendation slash parallel track of the report card within that context, I think we're going to make decisions much better get this done. And I think in, in addition to that, maybe you could be, staff could be prepared with here are the things we can do now and can't do. And I'm just going to throw out there 
for example, the writing recommendation, is that still on here? It's number five. So adding seventh grade writing, I know one of the issues is right now we don't believe we have a test for this year. So if we think that, if staff thinks that's something you would put in the straw man, it's obviously not for this year, so there would be a recommendation about time. So some of these recommendations might be for now and they might be for later, but they could all be part of the straw man. Okay, thumbs up, thumbs down with uh, agreeing with uh, member trans suggestion that we send the whole list to staff to come back with a straw man. Okay, so just as a matter of clarification, I, I, mm -hmm. I felt uh, some limitations in terms of taking license with recrafting recommendations that had come from other stakeholder groups. Mm -hmm. So, I my plan would be to go back to those groups and plunge through some of these questions with them and and see if there's a consensus with them as well as then fitting it into the broader context of the OIP. No, I mean, with all due respect, I, I, I think the answer, I mean, the way that I would proceed would be there's enough data uh, and, and both and information from the respective organizations and groups um, for us to now come back and organize a set of uh, recommendations that include um, a, a pretty cl clear delineation of uh, what we are trying to solve, what's the problem we're trying to solve, how does the recommendation attempt to solve that problem, does it agree or does it not agree with the constituent groups that have opined on that, on that particular issue, and if there's a layout or an implementation scheme, what's that look like time-wise, right? So I, I would just simply say there's enough information right now between what we've heard from the community forums, the meetings that I've had uh, with superintendents and with COSA, meetings that have come in here from the prior meeting, to, act, to aggregate all of that now and put it down in a format and a form that makes sense for the committee to consider as a as a coherent set of recommendations. I'm sorry? Uh, maybe it's because of having been that person who's been interacting with districts all across the state. I mean, there, there are a lot of uh, subtleties around many of these issues that, uh, I mean, we can bring certainly a straw man proposal forward, but I could see a diverse set of opinion of folks pushing back on whatever that straw man yeah, contains. Ten, 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 just by the process, okay, just, just, let me just say this as clearly as I can. The process should not be to come in here and grapple with work that staff should do. So, with all due respect, Margie, this would be something that I know that there are going to be some pushbacks from. I expect that there's always going to be pushback. But we would have considered that and make our considered judgment to the committee Based upon what we, what, uh, based upon our best information at the time, and that's all. That's all anybody can ask is that we bring that. I'm more than happy to bring that. Now, if 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 there are nuances about this, then yes. In fact, you and others and I would go back out and talk to people and get feedback as to whether or not it's it's up or down or good or bad or how we want to shape that recommendation. But but at some point, this be, this begins to feel a little bit like a kind of a group group. And I'm just not there, to be perfectly honest with you. So there's enough information now for us to develop a coherent set of recommendations with respect to the compacts. I think that there is a need for conversation around the theory behind the compacts and whether or not it is applicable the same at pre-K 12 as it is to community colleges and higher ed. That's a, that's a reasonable conversation to have. I think that there's also a need for us to actually understand where some of the pushback is. If in fact that there's some, you know, nuances around this that we all ought to hear and know, you know, that came out of either committee or discussions that you've had, that's perfectly fine. But I think at the end of the day, you know, I, I'm I'm not going to come here and ask this committee to essentially um, draft the recommendations, and that's where I think the role gets into a bit of confusion because I'm I, I, I'm I'm. I'm not of the opinion that that's the role of this committee. You should adopt or not adopt or say why you don't adopt, but ultimately, you know, you have to have something from which to work. I agree, because I think trying to get consensus from the field is very difficult, and that's why we have the board, and that's why we have the subcommittees, is to hear all of that and then 
right. be the deciders, right? Yeah. Did you want to add mine? Yeah. And just to kind of go along with the coming in with a recommendation to this committee, as I mentioned with the tie-in of the report card, but um, I think it, I really liked how Margie put on here, this is a legislative issue, this is an OEIB option. Within your recommendations, it would be great to see these over here, we're going to have to go through the legislative process for these over here, we can make this decision now. But I think we want to say from this committee, do we agree that you ought to take it to the legislative process? Well, that's what I mean. Yeah. Is, is it, I, mean, I really like how we've got some, it helped me frame, that's a real timeline issue then. Yeah. If we're waiting for the legislature and to end with a decision to pass something and throw it back, that's going to extend it out, which means this June 30 next year. It plays into my mind timing as opposed to can we make a decision in a couple months. Okay, so I think we're at a place of uh, coming back with a straw man, hoping that we will be able to come to consensus on a set of information. And I think this one does have a tight timeline because after our next meeting, the next one is December 11th, and it's the same day as the OEIB meeting. And I think we're hoping that we would <laughs> be able, I know that speaking as a superintendent, I know I'd like to just know. <laughs> What are we going to do and what is the timeline? Because I think at this point there's been enough conversation about it. And I just want to also remind us that we agreed that this is an evolving process. And so I guess I just want to also bring out we may make some changes that we go forward and try and then find out they didn't work so well, right? And we'll get that feedback. I'm sure we will. And I think we need to be ready to rethink some of the decisions because we're inventing some really new stuff here in a new way. And so so not to put it all on one person or one body to get it perfect. I think we need to own that we need decision makers and right now we have a leader who can go put this uh, process together, the, the straw man together, and then we confirm those or not. Okay. Any more questions about the Achievement Compact for K-12, because we have one more invited testimony around Community College uh, Achievement Compact. Okay, Elizabeth Cox Brand. Sorry to surprise you last meeting, but now I know we gave you time to prepare. I was going to say, I'm not going to be quite as animated as I was last meeting. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, Chair Curtis, Dr. Crew, members of the committee. Elizabeth Cox Brand, I'm the Director of Research and Communications for Community Colleges and Workforce Development. And that's about all my time. Um, <laughs> I was asked to, to provide some research behind our different outcome measures on the Achievement Compact. And you've got two different pieces um, that I believe have been distributed. One of them has got a little more narrative to it. I created one that's um, just the front and back. It's a little bit more concise. Uh, so I hope, yes, you've got that one. Right. Nope, it looks like this. Yes, with links. Yes, uh, they both have links. So, uh, not all of the measures on the Community College Achievement Compacts are addressed here. Um, there were some that directly relate to 404020 that we didn't feel like we needed to go through and actually put more of the research around because we're going to have to measure those um, regardless. One of the things that I'd like to do with my time before you today is to um, do what I think is really important with research, and that's bring it back to the context that we live in here in Oregon. So we look at some of these things, and you can say, we've got this national research, we've got this national research. What does it mean here on the ground? So even as you were talking, Dr. Crew, and mentioning um, what's the challenge that we're trying to address, that's some of the things that I, I'm going to discuss in that we can go through and we can look at a lot of different research. And you know, research can say, yes, this is the way it is, or no, this is the way it is, often. So if we look at the numbers that we have for community colleges, this might give us a little bit more of an idea why we're looking at these specific measures. So starting with um, adult high school diplomas and GEPs, um, this is something that obviously relates to 404020. Um, but we feel it's very important for us to look at in the community colleges because currently, uh, according to the American Community Survey, there's over 375,000 Oregonians without a high school diploma or a GED. They're over 15, they're out of high school, um, they have limited English proficiency. Um, if we're going to meet 404020, we've got to start serving these folks more aggressively. Yeah, yeah of Oregonians. It's roughly about 11%. Mm -hmm. uh, so we need to be looking at this and we need to be paying attention. 
Um, another important piece of that is that with current financial, federal financial aid changes, now in order to get federal financial aid, a student has to have a high school diploma or a GED. And so even if these students want to come in, if these individuals without the GED want to come to the community college, they'd have to pay for it by themselves. And we know about how realistic that would be. So last year we uh, had about 8,000, a little over 8,000 students pass the GED. And of those 2011 completers, 77% were between the ages of 16 and 24. So this is a young group. This is a young group that we're serving. So we feel that's an important, important measure for us to, to be looking at. Transfers. Um, transfers is something uh, that we feel is very important to measure uh, because here in Oregon, that's a huge piece of what our community colleges do. Um, there was a study by the National Student Clearinghouse that is listed on here that showed that nationwide, 45% of students who had obtained a baccalaureate degree had previously enrolled in a community college. In Oregon, that's 62%. We're fifth highest in the nation for the numbers of students earning baccalaureates that have had completions or had previously enrolled in a community college. Last year, uh, we had over 6,500 transfers to the Oregon University System. Colleges. Um, enrollment in developmental education, math and writing. Um, we even put on here that it's, it's incredibly important um, to be looking at this, obviously, but again, the research is inconclusive. Um, one reason that that's inconclusive is that we have different pedagogy, we have different cut scores, we have different tests, we have different things all across the nation as far as um, there's no consistency with that. Um, we feel that it's important for us to be watching this, primarily because uh, there's a couple of reasons, but primarily last year we had over 60,000 students who enrolled in at least one developmental math or reading course. 60,000 students. So it's important for us to be watching these, these numbers and watch what's happening, see what's working, so that we can gain some insight in Oregon what exactly is going on and how we can reduce those numbers. Um, there was a report that just came out yesterday from ACT showing that 60% of students are underprepared for college. And these are all the challenges that we're trying to address as we look at these compact measures. Um, on, the, on the flip side, we look at students who are earning 15 or 30 college credits. This is what is called the uh, milestones and momentum points. You may be familiar um, with Washington's study of this. Um, obviously, if you're earning 15 and 30, or 30 credits in a given year, that's helping gain your momentum toward actually earning a credential or a degree. Uh, it also increases your earnings. Even if you were to stop out at a point, which many of our students do, um, you would at least have a higher earning than you would without any of these credits at all. Um, the Florida study also shows that uh, the odds of graduating increased for all students once they received the certain milestone, which for them was about 20 credits, but it was specifically important for young students. Then reaching this milestone point of even 20 non-remedial credits helped them to increase it, their persistence to graduation. And so for us, we're looking at about 36% of our students are under the age of 25. So that would be something that's important to us as well. And dual enrollment, we've talked about this a lot. Um, the dual credit is what we're talking about in Oregon, dual credit. And that gets confusing because when I was in Iowa, it was dual enrollment. And we just had this big discussion yesterday about what's dual credit, what's dual enrollment, what's concurrent enrollment. But we're talking about dual credit. So it's those courses that are taken by high school students, taught in the high school, by a person who's been certified by the institution to say, yes, you can teach it. Um, this is something that's important to us at the community colleges as well as the K-12s. As we look at this, I know it's very important um, with your, your measures, um, Yvonne. Um, but it's not only them gaining those credits in high school, which is going to help propel them, but we even have studies from here in Oregon, which we're working on the 2012 study. But from 2010, our last study showed that um, students taking dual credit, it doubles their likelihood that they're going to enroll in an institution of higher education. And it doubles their likelihood that they're going to attain a four-year degree within six years. It's, they have a higher college participation rate, they're more likely to persist first term to second term, which is a huge drop point for a lot of our students. And they have a higher first year GPA than those students who do not have dual credit. So those are just the key points for what we're looking at. Um, you're more than welcome to 
uh, ask me anything about these different pieces of research, but uh, that's that's the Oregon perspective. Dr. Very helpful. Do you um, do you have the the data as it relates to um, some of these broken out by ethnicity and gender mm -hmm. sort of thing? Yes, we do. It'd be very helpful to have that against okay. these. Sure, sure. I'm glad to get that to you. We just now, just now, have our 2011-12 uh, completions data in, so we'll be working on all of that. I mean, one of the reasons that I'm asking the question is that it 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 seems that the the, the pre-K-12 connection here mm -hmm. looks at disaggregated data in a way that helps us to focus on. Subgroups that are that are not making it as far as fast and so on and so forth, right. and yet I don't see that respect uh, respectfully in in this in this. These are data sets that, for the most part, are are are, are outcomes based. Mm -hmm. But I, I'm just asking, as as it currently sits, mm -hmm. do you look at it in relation to who it is that's actually making this progress or lack of? Uh, in the system, according to these metrics? Sure. With these metrics, we do break them out on the context by um, race, ethnicity, and, and uh, hell recipient. That's Gender. our one. Gender, we don't currently. Right. Right. Currently, we do just race, race ethnicity, and uh, low socioeconomic. And all of our colleges have their compacts. Now, so all of our colleges have this disaggregated yeah. Yeah. information. No, I, meant, I meant for the purpose of uh, of how you were looking at this before, before compact data came into existence. Mm -hmm. Is this something that you disaggregated by ethnicity and just looked at overall? Sure. So you you were in the habit of this kind of right this kind of look before compact data came into existence. Right. Okay. There is uh, Commissioner Croix has a student success oversight committee, which is looking at student success indicators. And there are various pieces in these compacts which are also part of that. Um, the 15 to 30 credits is one point. Um, the passing of the developmental ed type things, that's another point. Those are just aggregated, um, but I can't tell you exactly, Dr. Crew, if they're it's by fun, race or ethnicity. Or, I just want to know if it, if it exists already. Yes. This is not something that's necessarily brand new. No, which was part of the thing that we yeah. were talking about in implementing the compacts. We were saying, we've been looking at this. We've been looking at this for years, so this is just a way to share it. Mark? And then I, I would really like to see some statistics on gender. Okay. That would be possible. And a couple other things was to throw out. GEDs. Mm -hmm. I've heard, read, maybe, you know, it's in our summer research, you find a story, or you're reading a sound like the MSN, you want to know research based it is. <laughs> but I would love to see a research on GEDs and kids being successful in the GED workforce in the future. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you probably have this, but I'd like to see it. I've heard Nick's, we are measuring GEDs as a completion of the K-12 compacts, but is a GED positioning kids for success? Right. And that's the first one. Second one, uh, in the Eastern Promise, we're having a great remedial compass test debate. <laughs> I just leave it at that. But I would really, I, I've recently seen, again, articles about how research-based are they, about that GPA is a more successful mm -hmm. indicator on a student's success. And the fact that we're having kids are disadvantaged learners not getting through the compass test, being in remedial classes and not completing. Right as opposed to what if those kids were in a grade level, 100 level class. Mm -hmm. It's something that, you know, we talk about remediation, kindergartners the first day of August, mm -hmm. but they get put into kindergarten. Mm -hmm. So I would love to see the most current, solid research on the issue of placement testing. You're going to get me into some hot water. I, you are, but I don't, <laughs> I, I'd like to see that. I'd okay. like to see it because I, I, we look at our completions, we look at our kids, our disadvantaged kids. Right. Mm -hmm. What are we doing with those assessments right. to keep kids from completing? 
it, that's a huge topic. It is. It's a huge it topic, is. and it's one that I know our uh, chief in, instructional administrators talk about quite frequently. Yeah. Um, we talk about the different assessments that are done, the different cut scores that are across the state, all of that kind of thing. Right. Um, and I, I know the article to which you refer, and that was something that we've talked about, and I was talking with Cam about this too, how if, if that's true, and it seems to be true, if you have a student who's close to the cut score, and then you bring in their GPA, and then you can look at that and let that be a little bit more of the decision point. Okay, this student maybe had a bad day, whatever happened, has a good GPA in high school. Okay, let's give that person the benefit of the doubt. Off they go. Put them in 105 instead of 90. Right, right. And so as we've talked about that, um, I'm seeing this as an opportunity in this way, that um, with the changes in federal financial aid, now we're going to have to be collecting high school diplomas high school transcript information, that kind of thing, at the community college level, which previously we've not done consistently across the board. That could be an advantage for us because then we may have some of this information available so then we could start implementing some practice like that. Um, where that is here, I'm not sure. Um, but that's something in which I'm very interested to see what we could do to help move students through to me, I mean, the whole idea of achievement complex is for me to, to have these kind of conversations. Exactly. Uh, what are our best practices for kids to get to these targets so we get kids completing? Exactly. And are we measuring the right indicators and metrics to have that conversation on best practices? Right. Right. Exactly. David? Yeah, I, I, I'm aware of the student success indicators, and I believe it was the 20 odd milestones. Momentum points. Milestones and momentum yeah, points. milestones and momentum points we have, and I, I realize there's some some of these come straight from that, and they're they're very good points to be looking at. I think the the um, consternation I hear is more putting these into this this accountability structure that we currently have with the compact, and say. Man, how many percentage points are we going to move year to year on this? And I don't know if that's some of that's in this research leading us in how we're going to set that or not, but I think that uh, maybe it's not so much a question for you. I think it's really for the committee here. But it's, you know, it's one thing acknowledging these and their importance, but the connection between the resources we have and the practices <laughs> we're implementing and how we're going to um, trigger changes on these. I think there's, there's still a lot of questions in the post-secondary community about exactly what are those connections. I don't, I just want to add that comment here. I think it's, uh, maybe that's as we look at a different framework for our achievement compacts possibly, uh, to think, keep that in mind that maybe just putting in um, targets without really thinking about the resources and the focusing on them and where we're go uh, how we're achieving that is not always in the best interest of what we want to do. I just wanted to add one comment back to Mark's conversation, and part of it is, um, you know, so I think about the remedial piece and about whether it's the test or GPA. I'm also thinking that part of it isn't just the conversation about the tool and how we make the decisions, but it's what is the strategy. Mm -hmm. So for example, I know for at least eight years in K-12, we've been in these conversations about detracking and not putting kids in tracks determined by early placement mm -hmm. tests, but instead giving them access to what they need, which in the K-12 world is grade level, in community college, it might be access to what they want, which is a college course, mm -hmm. and then providing the support on top. And I know it, it is a resource question, but it's also not a resource question. So if students are already paying for remedial courses, the idea of going ahead and taking a college-level course and a support course right. along with it might actually save money. And in our high school, for example, detracking, giving kids access to higher level. I mean, the research is really clear mm -hmm. that even if kids go to an AP class and get an F, 
they're more prepared and are more successful in college courses because of the rigor. I don't think that's different because, and I don't know the research on it at all, but it just common sense says, just because I'm crossing the line from high school to community college, Mm -hmm. the same concept about giving me access to where where I really want to go and providing me the support makes so much more sense than gate keeping me out of there until I'm ready and I'm spinning my wheels, spinning my wheels. In the meantime, self-esteem, money, everything is kind of going down that track. So I just want to add, I know that uh, COSA and Cam and others are planning on putting a group together, so I just want to say I don't think we expect all of that information to come from you and be on your shoulders as one person, (laughs) just like we were saying to Margie. I mean, we all have to be in the conversation. If you can provide us the research and data, what I also want to do is lean on all the other organizations that are having these conversations to make sure that all of these pieces get discussed, that it's not just, for example, dual credit, but it's, it's all the other issues around that as well. So I just hope that whoever's engaged in those conversations is hearing that request, because I'm really excited to hear that conversation. And I don't even know all the groups. I know at one time, one of the questions we had in COSA was uh, the Higher Education Coordinating Commission and what they were doing in relationship to these conversations. So I know there's a lot of different groups having the conversation. So anyway, I look forward to those all coming here. So I invite those who are having those conversations to get in touch with Margie so we would know where to have uh, your conversations included uh, in our best practices meeting. Any other questions or comments around the community college achievement compact? Just a comment that, okay. you know, this is hard work, but it's exciting once again, mm-hmm. this whole effort that we're all spending time in this room for. We've never had this conversation before, Marie. We've never had a conversation very clearly on high, high school, which is what we just talked about. We haven't had a conversation of pre-K to what kindergarten looks like. So to me, this is hard work, and thank you for everything you're doing. It. Thank you for providing the information. In terms of decision making around the community college achievement compact, we do know that a couple of organizations, I know for example OCCA and was there another one coming next time? AFT Oregon and OEA. Okay. Um, When we had public testimony at our last meeting, um, several groups said we're refining some recommendations to bring to this group. So just like the K-12 recommendations, I believe that it makes sense to have those recommendations go to staff to make a straw man proposal. So I just wanna, I'm I'm thinking about the timeline and the December 11th timeline that's coming up really quickly. If there's a way that we can get those recommendations to staff before they come to this group, perhaps you might be ready with a straw man even for the community colleges. Because if we wait till after that, it only gives you two weeks before the December 11th. So that we could expect at the next meeting um, a straw man for the K-12 recommendations, some public testimony, about I mean invited testimony from community college organizations, as well as a straw man from staff for us to have a discussion about. I think those two pieces would be um, things that we could discuss and perhaps move some recommendations to OEIB at that point. Uh, just to highlight for this board, another conversation that's been going on amongst many groups has been around the ELL collaborative work. And um, I know we're thinking about having some people give invited testimony around that work at the OEIB meeting. So it makes sense to have those same people provide testimony to this subcommittee as well on the same day where we can have a little discussion about it, as opposed to it just coming to the board and then we just kind of sit with it for the next two weeks without that opportunity to discuss. Does that make sense? Does anyone have a concern about inviting that? That's a good idea. Was there anything else uh, we had on the list? I think that concludes today's agenda, uh, okay. except for the public, public testimony. testimony. Correct. Okay. So if there aren't any more questions or issues of committee members, I'm going to move to public testimony. Okay. Emma Callaway from Oregon Student Association. So we'd like to allow two minutes for public testimony. That's plenty. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. 
My name is Emma Calloway. I'm the legislative director for the Oregon Student Association. We don't have members with us today because they're in class and um, we're trying to keep students in the classroom. So I'm here to testify specifically on achievement compacts and I wanted to first just clarify that the Oregon Student Association represents over 100,000 students in post-secondary education. We work with community colleges and universities and um, I think there are a great number of things that the Student Association would like to talk with you and work with you in terms of um, improving achievement compacts. I'm here today to talk specifically about the affordability piece. We think that one key piece that is missing from the achievement compacts is some indicator of affordability. And when we've talked about this with the OAIB in the past, um, and we've heard from community colleges and universities, that it's hard to compare tuition prices. It's not really apples to apples. So what we would like to propose and that um, we'd like to bring back to you all is that you include some sort of indication about debt levels. We think that that is an apples to apples comparison even across community colleges and universities that we can actually be addressing affordability from looking at are our institutions considering tuition levels, the you know, rising cost of operating budgets, a lack of state funding, all of those are really difficult cost indicators and we understand that. But we think that our institutions should be looking at debt levels and should be thinking about, are we creating an affordable tuition level? Do we have the right type of aid in order to keep low income and underrepresented communities in the classroom? So we'd ask very specifically, and that's actually all I'm going to testify about today, is that you add debt levels um, or some other measure of affordability that you can compare across institutions of post-secondary education. And I'm happy to take any questions. Just the specifics, would that be tracking something like uh, federal student aid debt, something that we could easily get statistics on, or are there other types of student debt we could possibly be looking at? Yeah, we've heard that this information could be difficult to, to actually find, and we understand that. Um, I think the federal aid um, levels or the federal debt levels are a great place to start. We'd like to see that in each individual institution does a better job of tracking their average debt level. And since we are you know, developing a rather complex uh, data modeling system across, across the system, we'd like to add this data point because uh, we think it's important, even though it will be difficult to, to find it first. Do you see Senator Wyden's federal initiative to create a return on investment? for families and students so they can see what the debt is and return on investment for careers from different institutions. Do you see that as a starting point or do you see that as something different? We see it as a starting point and we have um, talked to um, Congressman Wyden's, or Senator Wyden's office about that. Um, but we think that, there, that that is about getting information out to families so that they can make a decision. We think that there's a necessary tension that needs to exist that holds institutions accountable to actually saying, what is our debt level? Can we do a better job of making education more affordable? So we think that both should exist and that they are different. And are your, have your members raised other points too? Because I've heard other uh, worries about access. We currently have a very um, system very centered on access with its enrollment uh, basis. What what are some have your members brought up any worries about access in light of the achievement compacts or you know, too much uh, too much focus maybe on, on reaching certain targets without at the expense of access? Well. Uh, in relation to the, to the debt point I was making, we think that is an indicator of access. We think that students choose to go to school if they can afford it, and we know that it opens doors. Um, our members don't have a problem with focusing on access. It's core to our mission. We think that it's very important that we get students in the door, and we're happy to see that completion rates and other points are on there. Um, we just don't want to lose the other point that I would make and that students have been making at OEIB visits around the state is that um, if we are talking about moving towards completion, we want to be very clear that the operating budgets of our institutions need to be protected as well. We don't think that relying on a high tuition, high aid model works and Oregonians are very price sensitive and so if we are going to talk about access and completion, we need to make sure at the end of the day we're also paying our teachers and paying financial aid officers and academic advisors because those are the people, that's a general operating budget that we think has been cut and those are the people that get students through the door and to graduation. Does that answer your question? 
I think in, in light of debt, yeah, student debt affecting access. I think so. Thank you. The last thing I'll say, just in conclusion, is that we think that student debt level also is important for the quality and uh, effectiveness of Oregon's economy. We think that students right now who are graduating with an average of $25,000 in debt are not buying homes. They're choosing you know, which jobs to take. They're, they're foregoing being social workers and teachers and firefighters and other things um, in order to move in towards higher paying jobs. And we think that there, there needs to be a group of people, hopefully yourselves, that focus on affordability and access. And we think that debt level could be an indicator that would help us maintain a true you know, middle class and strong workforce here in Oregon. Thank you very much. Thank it's you very much. It's always great to hear from students. Yeah, Thank absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments from the committee? I'm going to adjourn, but before I do, I want to let this committee know that lunch is being provided for us since we have to move quickly to another meeting. So I'm not sure where that means. In the back room. In the back room. All right. Okay. <laughs> okay. Now I adjourn this meeting.